Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and I can remember one of the very first times that I saw the power of God on display during a time of Eucharistic adoration. Now, you might be listening in and thinking, hold on a minute. I don't know what Eucharistic adoration is. What is that? Don't worry. I'll explain it to you in just a second. But I was at this conference where Eucharistic adoration was taking place. And so the priest was carrying around this golden instrument, which we call a monstrance. And inside the monstrance was a host of what used to be bread, but we as Catholics believe during the mass had transformed into the body of Jesus. So the priest was carrying this monstrance around with the sacred host, the blessed sacrament inside. And people were adoring Jesus as he was being brought to them in a procession through the crowd. So the priest is walking through the people. People are bowing down, kneeling before Jesus in the Eucharist as he's being brought to them. And I'm kneeling in the back with some of my friends. And beside me is a girl who I'm friends with. Now, this girl is a very shy girl. Uh, She's not very dramatic. She doesn't like to be the center of attention, which is important for the story because as the priest was coming by with the monstrance and he lifted up the blessed sacrament over us, my friend looked into the monstrance, looked at Jesus face to face. And then even though no one was touching her, no one hit her, suddenly she flew back through the air like she was knocked off of her feet by some kind of invisible spiritual force. So she flies through the air and she's just crumpled on the ground. It was like this bolt of energy, this bolt of lightning had come from the monstrance and just struck her down. Now, the reason that this took place is because, like I said, we as Catholics believe that this truly is Jesus. That even though it looks like bread and wine at mass, it actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And so she was really coming into contact with God himself. And she had the faith to recognize who he was and the power that was flowing from the Eucharistic Jesus as he was being processed in this monstrance during Eucharistic adoration was enough to literally knock her over. Now, if you've been to adoration before, you might not have experienced something like that. And I've been to adoration many times where this hasn't happened. But sometimes God gives us these little glimpses of his power to show us just how intense his presence is in the Eucharist, how powerful adoration can be. And the reason I share this story is because the saint I want to tell you about today loved Eucharistic adoration, and she worked so hard to make sure that the devotion to the Eucharist and that adoration of the Blessed Sacrament was spread throughout the world. And her name is Saint Juliana of Liège. Now, Juliana was born in the country of Belgium, in the city of Liège, in 1191. And she was born at the same time as her twin sister, whom her parents named Agnes. Now, Juliana and Agnes, unfortunately, they barely got to know their parents because they were orphaned at the young age of five, which is truly heartbreaking. And so Agnes and Juliana, they had no one to care for them. And so the girls were sent to an Augustinian convent to be taken care of by the nuns there. The nuns there were very kind, very charitable, and they took in these orphan girls who had no family to care for them. Now, the girls lived not in the convent itself, but on a farm near to the convent, and they were cared for by the holy nuns who lived there. And they gave the girls a great education. Uh, They showed them how to pray. They really tried to be the family for them that they didn't have. And one of the nuns who was really close with the girls was a nun named Sister Sapienza. Sister Sapienza kind of became a mother figure for the two girls, and she taught them how to love the Eucharist. She taught them that they could spend time with Jesus, who was truly present under the appearance of bread and wine, which is something that all Catholics believe. And she taught the girls, Juliana and Agnes, she said, you can just sit or kneel before Jesus in the tabernacle where he's kept in the church, and you can talk to him like he's a friend. You can spend time with him. Uh, You can spend time with him in a way that you would spend time with any of your other friends, those who you love, because he's always there waiting for you to come and visit him. 
And so Sister Sapienza had a great impact on their lives. Um, unfortunately, Agnes too died soon after they moved into this new living arrangement with the nuns. We don't know why, possibly it was an illness, but by the time Juliana was an early teen, she was the only surviving member of her family. Can you imagine what that must have been like for her? She was thinking to herself how she's the only one of her family left. She's all alone in the world. And I'm sure she was asking God, why me? Why am I here all by myself? What exactly are you planning here? Now, of course, Sister Sapienza could see that Juliana was struggling. And so she encouraged her, Juliana, go and tell Jesus about the pain that is going on in your heart. And so like the nuns had taught her, Juliana began to spend more and more time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. She began to spend her time in adoration, pouring out her heart to God. And as she did so, Jesus began to console her in her loneliness. Jesus was present to her, encouraging her, comforting her, giving her gifts of peace and joy that go beyond anything this world can offer. And one of Juliana's favorite scripture passages from the Bible that she would read as she was there in front of Jesus was Jesus's words in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where he says, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And Juliana realized that it was in adoration, in the Eucharist, that Jesus was fulfilling this promise because he was really and truly present with her and would be present with the church until the end of time. Now, in the absence of her family, Sister Sapienza became more and more like a mother to her. They were very close. And so Juliana naturally began spending more and more time at the convent, praying with the nuns, volunteering with them at the hospital that they staffed. And Juliana loved these sisters who had become her new family so much that she eventually decided that she wanted to join them permanently. She wanted to join in their life of prayer and taking care of the poor. And so when she was only 13 years old, she officially entered into the convent and began living as an Augustinian sister. And when she was 16 years old, she was praying before the Eucharist. Big surprise there. She was back again. And while she was there praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, she suddenly had a vision. She had this vision of a full moon shining brightly in the sky. But across the face of the moon, there was one dark line that was obscuring some of the light. She thought to herself, well, that's kind of weird. I've never had this before. I'll, I'll just ignore it. It must be my imagination. And then the next time she was in front of the Blessed Sacrament, it happened again. She saw the same moon and it kept happening over and over again. She kept seeing this vision and she got kind of freaked out, which I don't blame her. Wouldn't you get freaked out if you kept seeing the same vision over and over again? And it's kind of a weird vision. And she thought, well, maybe this is like some evil, dark, demonic spirit that's trying to distract me from my time during prayer. And so she became very afraid, but eventually she thought, well, this is happening during prayer. I'm just going to talk to Jesus about it. Like I do with all my problems. And so she began to ask the Lord, what does this vision mean? What's happening? What is your wisdom for me in this? And over time, Jesus revealed to her that he was showing her this moon for a reason. He showed her that the moon symbolized the life of the church. It symbolized the calendar of the church with all of the feast days celebrated on the church's calendar, because often calendars are organized around the phases of the moon. And the dark line represented an absence, a gap in the calendar. Because there was no feast in the church calendar at that point that was specifically for celebrating the Eucharist. And so the Lord Jesus showed her, I want you to increase devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, to the Eucharist. I want you to push for a specific feast celebrated in the church calendar where the world can celebrate my presence in the Blessed Sacrament. Now, Juliana didn't know where to start with this. She was just a teenager. She thought, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know how I can impact the church on a global level. I don't know how I'm going to be able to talk to the Pope about instituting a new feast day for the church. And so in prayer, she just sensed, okay, well, God will set up the right time for me to do this. If this is really his will, 
he will figure out a way for it to happen. And so in the meantime, she kept her visions secret. And for about 20 years, she kept these visions secret. She didn't tell anyone else about it. And she just prayed and waited for the Lord's timing. Now, eventually, she was elected to be the mother superior of the convent when she was in her late 30s. And when she was the superior of the convent, the Lord revealed to her, the time is now. The time is now for you to start advocating for this new feast day. And so she shared her visions with two other women, both of whom adored the Eucharist and loved the Lord as much as she did. And together they approached a wise priest and asked him for his advice. They said, Father, you know, how does this work? How exactly are we supposed to uh, promote this brand new feast day in the church? And is this something that you think the church would benefit from? Well, this, this guy loved the idea. He loved the fervor and the love that these women had for the Eucharist. And he began to talk with his friends who were theologians and high ranking uh, clerics and leaders in the church. And they all agreed as well. This would be a great idea. Yeah, let's have a celebration, a feast day for the Eucharist. And so Juliana and her sisters were overjoyed. They thought, well, this is working. This is, this is picking up speed. This is truly what the Lord's plan is. And his timing is perfect. And so Juliana and the priest began writing out all of the prayers and the directions for how the feast would be celebrated once it was put into the church's calendar. But just as things were beginning to look so good for Sister Juliana and her project, she began to experience some pushback. And from a pretty unlikely source, because the person who was giving her the most trouble was her own superior. So the Augustinian nuns, uh, there was also a male part of the Augustinians for priests, and the superior of the priests was a man named Father Roger. And rather than being overjoyed at this new feast day, Father Roger actually didn't like Juliana, and he saw her and her whole project as a threat. You might be wondering, well, why would a priest feel threatened by this feast day, why would he feel threatened by such a holy nun as Juliana? Well, Father Roger was not a good man. He was not a virtuous man. He had actually reached the point of being a leader of his community because he had bribed his way to the top. He had bribed leaders in the church in order to become the superior of the Augustinians, not because he wanted to lead well, but because he wanted power and he wanted to live a comfortable life. Now, Juliana knew this about him and she had called him out a couple of times because of his scandalous living. And we don't know what exactly are the details of the scandalous life that he was living, but we do know that since he took vows of poverty and chastity, we can assume that he was probably living either a luxurious, rich, wealthy life with maybe partying or food or or buying lots of things for himself, or maybe he had broken his promises of chastity and was living a life of impurity, or maybe he had broken both vows and that was what was so scandalous. But whatever it was, Juliana had called him out on his scandalous living and she was showing him up. Her and her sisters were living holy lives. They were praying all the time and starting all this devotion to the Eucharist. Meanwhile, he was a man who had bribed his way to the top and was living a life that was definitely not holy and devoted to God. And so he felt threatened by her. And so he began to spread rumors throughout the town to take her down. And he began to lie and tell people that Sister Juliana was stealing donations from the hospital for herself, that she was lining her own wallet with money that was supposed to be going to the poor and to the sick. And people began to believe him because they believed the priest who was the superior of an order. They thought, well, of course, why would he tell a lie about a nun like this? And rather than defending herself, which I'm sure she was tempted to do, Juliana realized that if she defended herself and got into this big political fight with this superior, that that would just be a distraction from her work to establish a Eucharistic feast day. And so humbly and quietly, Juliana agreed to leave behind her beloved convent and sisters and to just walk away from all of them for a while and to continue her work elsewhere. And this was very difficult for her because these sisters had become very close to her. 
She loved to live amongst them and pray with them. And so this, this exile away from her community was very painful. She ended up moving around, living with different friends who offered her a place to stay until finally the bishop actually removed Father Roger from his position and she was able to return home again. But her joy at returning back to her convent with her beloved sisters, it was very short-lived because soon after the bishop who had removed Father Roger died and Father Roger was able to manipulate, to claw his way back into power with the new bishop. And as soon as he was back in control, Juliana was forced out again, and this time for good. And so heartbroken that she had to leave her sisters again, her spiritual family who had replaced her biological family who had died when she was young, she was separated from all of them, and once again, she was forced to live on her own. And so just as she had when she was a teenager, missing her family, now missing her sisters, she once again returned to adoration of the Eucharist, pouring out her disappointment and her loneliness to the love of her life, who was Jesus, telling him about how unfair all of this was and how can Father Roger do this to me and just complaining to Jesus and, and, and letting him hear the cry of her heart. But she didn't let Father Roger take her peace away. She didn't let uh, resentment or bitterness settle there. She brought it all to Jesus, gave it over to him and said, Jesus, I surrender this whole situation to you. And true to his word, Jesus did not abandon her. He did not leave her alone, but again, comforted her, spoke to her, ministered to her as she spent hours and hours in adoration with him. Now, a nearby convent of Cistercian sisters, so a different order, took her in and said, you can come and live with us if you've been kind of removed from your own group. And she spent many years with them living in community and spreading the practice of adoring the Blessed Sacrament to everyone and anyone who would listen to her, making sure that this feast day celebrating the body and blood of Jesus would be promoted through the whole church. However, in the last years of her life with the Cistercians, she felt led by the Lord to spend even more time exclusively with him. And so she went into something called seclusion. Seclusion is kind of like solitary confinement, although it's voluntary. It's not like she went to prison. She chose to live by herself in her own small room where she spent almost her whole day in prayer. And she lived that way until eventually she grew older and weaker. And when she was 67 years old, she had reached the point where she was unable to even get out of bed. But she did receive permission when she knew she was dying to have the blessed sacrament brought into her room in a monstrance so that she could look at Jesus until the very moment of her death. So as she lay dying, she kept her eyes fixed on the blessed sacrament, seeing Jesus under the appearance of bread. And when her eyes closed for the last time here on earth, Jesus was the last thing that she saw. But when she opened up her eyes to the new reality of eternal life in heaven, her eyes were finally able to gaze on the face of Jesus, no longer under the appearance of bread, but as he truly looked. And six years after she died, the Pope declared the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is Latin for the body of Christ, to be celebrated by the entire church. He put it into the church's calendar and everything. A day for everyone to celebrate the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, given to us at every single Mass, proving that Jesus' promise was true, that he really will be with us until the end of the age. Now, St. Juliana did so much to promote adoration of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And as a result of her passionate love for the Lord, we still, to this day, celebrate the Feast of Corpus Christi every year throughout the entire world. Catholics everywhere celebrate the gift of the Eucharist because of the work that St. Juliana did in promoting this feast. And one thing that we can all practice so that we can become saints like her is developing our own love for Jesus in the Eucharist, especially through making time for adoration. Because in every single Catholic church, there is something called a tabernacle, 
which often looks like a golden box. It's often behind the altar or somewhere close to the front of the church. And this is where all of the consecrated hosts that have become the body of Jesus are kept. Often near the tabernacle, there's a candle that's normally red that is kept burning to symbolize the fact that Jesus really is there. That when you see that candle, it reminds you that you have come into the real presence of the true and living God. And you can take time, like Juliana did, to visit the church and spend time in front of the tabernacle. Adoration can be your personal time with Jesus, where you can share with him anything that's on your heart. Whatever is really burdening you in your life, whatever is giving you joy, you can talk with Jesus about it. And don't be surprised if you take some time in silence before him when he begins to speak back. Maybe he won't show you visions like he did with St. Juliana, but maybe he will. Maybe he'll inspire images in your mind. Maybe he'll give you words of scripture that will pierce your heart. Maybe he'll begin to speak to you in ways that you can understand that will really give you wisdom in what you're going through in your life. Sometimes the church will do something called exposition of the blessed sacrament, which is where the sacred host is taken out of the tabernacle and put into a monstrance. This is what I was describing at the very beginning of the show. And people will pray in silence before the monstrance. They'll sing songs of praise to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. They'll offer up other prayers to Jesus. And sometimes uh, the monstrance is carried around the church in processions, or it's even taken outside in big parades to honor Jesus, especially on the feast of Corpus Christi. And if you've never been to something like this, I highly encourage you to go and try it because it's the same Jesus who is in the tabernacle as the one who is put into the monstrance. It's not like it's a different Jesus that you're getting, depending on whether you go to adoration, where he's inside the tabernacle or whether he's being carried in the monstrance. But Eucharistic adoration where Jesus is exposed in the blessed sacrament, it makes it a little bit easier for us as humans to pray because we can actually look at the host. We can actually look into the Eucharistic face of Jesus and let him look back at us in turn. I was praying in this way once before a monstrance, looking at Jesus, really truly present under the appearance of bread. And as I was looking at him and letting him look at me, I was prompted to read what has become one of my favorite scripture passages to read during adoration from the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, where it says, Behold, there he stands, behind our wall, gazing in at the window, looking through the lattice. And to me, that just described Jesus in the Eucharist. He was looking at me through the window of the monstrance, looking at me through the gold, of the instrument that he was being held in. And he was saying to me in the very next verse, my beloved speaks to me and says to me, arise my love, my fair one, and come away. Jesus, my Eucharistic King, was calling to me from the monstrance, calling me away to himself to spend more time with him. And I know that he has the same desire to spend time with you. Adoration is for everyone. If you are a Catholic and you truly believe that the Eucharist is really Jesus, then why wouldn't you want to spend time with him? It's not just something for priests and nuns. You can go for as long or as short as you're able to. If you have a family, bring the kids. Come just as you are. Don't worry if they're distracted. Don't worry if you're distracted. Jesus wants the real you and he delights in your presence when you come to him in adoration. If you're listening in and you're not a Catholic, but you're a Christian who loves Jesus and you're not sure if you believe in this whole Eucharistic thing, here's my invitation to you. Why not just try it out? Go into a Catholic church or attend Eucharistic exposition and just say a simple prayer like, Jesus, if that's really you, then show yourself to me. I don't want to miss out on a new way to draw closer to you. One of my friends was telling me about this time when he had evangelized a college friend of his who was a Muslim. 
This Muslim guy had converted to Christianity, but he wasn't sure if he was committing to being Catholic yet. He was still kind of looking at all these different uh, Christian expressions and ways of, of living out his faith. And so uh, my friend was going to adoration and he invited his former Muslim friend to come with him. And he was like, well, I'm not sure if I believe that's Jesus. I, I don't know if this is something I can do. And my friend said, just come and try it out. I promise you can leave whenever you want. Just come and see. So they both go into adoration. And eventually my friend decides that it's time for him to leave. And so he gets up and leaves. But his friend stays inside. The former Muslim is inside praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And eventually when he comes out, my friend says, hey, like what's going on in there? And all that his friend could say was, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Over and over again, that's Jesus. That's all he could say. He was convinced just from being in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament that the Jesus who he had fallen in love with, the Jesus who he had decided to leave Islam for, was truly present in that monstrance. So give it a try. Whether you are firmly believing in the Eucharist or whether this is something new to you, I invite you to go and spend time in adoration and let the Lord speak to you. Because all of us, no matter where we're at in our faith with God, we can open ourselves up to a deeper encounter with him. And adoration is by far one of the best ways to do, to do this because you are actually coming into the real presence of God. So there's no way you can leave unchanged. It changed Juliana, right? It helped her overcome the grief and loneliness of losing her family. It helped her to forgive those who had treated her unjustly in her life. It gave her peace despite the persecution she was facing. And it gave her the grace to live a life of radical holiness, helping her to die without fear, ready to go to heaven. That is the power of Eucharistic adoration. And so let's pray that we would become saints just like St. Juliana and grow in our love for the Eucharist. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Juliana, you loved to adore Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Help us to never doubt that the bread and the wine are forever changed at the Mass as they become the body and the blood of Jesus. Let us grow in our love for the Eucharistic King as he comes to us under the appearance of bread and wine. Let us imitate you in seeking out opportunities to adore the Lord in the tabernacles of our churches, in the monstrance, and during Eucharistic processions, always remembering to be thankful that Jesus has not abandoned us, but will be with us to the end of the age. St. Juliana of Liege, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.